How's it going, everybody? This is Alex from Fireside Giants and Empire Sports Media Production, and you're listening to the Fireside Giants podcast. If you're a diehard Giants fan, you've come to the right place, my friend. Daily episodes, interviews, draft content, and so much more. Make sure to drop a like and a subscription below on YouTube, and don't forget to leave a comment. We love to engage with everybody. Today's episode is going to be about a mock draft from Lance Zerline, NFL Network analyst, right? Lance Zerline, you know, he comes out with his draft predictions everything every single year, especially for all the prospects, weaknesses, strengths. He puts a lot of effort and work into it. So I like to take a look at his mock drafts and see what he's got going on. Now, he has the Giants doing something very, very interesting, and it is a trade up instead of a trade back with one of their uh, first two, uh, their one of their first two first round picks. So it's uh, going to be an interesting scenario for us to break down, take a look at who he ends up grabbing. But Anthony, before we dive into the good stuff, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great, and I'm really intrigued by this mock draft scenario from Lance Airline. I actually really like Lance Airline. Every year, I go on NFL.com. I look at his prospect profilers, see what grades he's giving out, because usually they do tend to stack up pretty closely to the ones given out by NFL executives. He's got a lot of connections on the inside. Um, he talks to a lot of people. He's got really well connected from NFL Network. Um, of course, former NFL Network analysts have gone into front offices like Mike Mayock. So he's got some great connections there. And I really do value the grades that he puts out on most prospects. So this mock draft is definitely interesting. It's an early one. It's the first one that he's done all offseason long. But to have the Giants trading up is definitely a little, a little bit of a shock because we've been talking for quite a while now, Alex, about the Giants maybe trading down. And even um, we even heard rumors and reports that they're shopping the fifth overall pick at the Senior Bowl. So it definitely sounds like they're interested in trading down. But this mock draft has them going up. And there's a pretty good reason why. So I'm pretty interested from this mock draft and excited to discuss it with you, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Joe Shane, the new general manager for the New York Giants, has already said that he is interested in moving back, moving up, whatever it's going to be to get the most value out of this draft class, right? And he said that the roster at the state it's in, they need more swings of the bat than they do um, you know, less. So that would indicate that they're probably going to try and trade back with one of those picks and gather more, uh, you know, more capital. But in this scenario, the Giants are like, okay, we have a lot of picks right now. We have nine selections, two of them in the first round. Let's move up a little bit and try and snag the best offensive tackle available. And, and Lance Zerline goes right ahead and, and does that because uh, the first overall pick for the Jacksonville Jaguars is none other than Evan Neal out of Alabama, which poses a very interesting situation for the Giants because now they are at four picks and a couple of those teams could really use offensive linemen ranging from you know the Jets to Houston. One of those guys could say, let's go get NC State standout uh, tackle Ikema Kwonu. Now, that obviously is a concern for the Giants because they're going to want Neil or Aquonu to lock down that right tackle spot. So in this scenario, Lance Erline says, hell, let's trade up two spots with Houston and get our guy. Um, now, it's definitely possible. And in this draft, in this mock draft, actually, um, <clears throat> it's interesting because the Giants, you know, the, the Jets end up taking, I believe, let's see here. They end up taking um Kyle Hamilton out of Notre Dame but you know they could have went with Ikem Aquonu and I think it makes sense to, for them to do this but the, uh, the 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 question is how much are they giving up to move up two spots from five to three it could be significant it could be their second round pick and in that case do you just go with Charles Cross at five or is it worth to give up the second round pick and get Aquonu Anthony I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves is the drop off from Aquonu to Charles Cross that significant that it's worth giving up on your second round pick I mean, it's it's a hard sell, but it probably is worth giving up your second round pick. If the Giants are looking at it as we need an instant day one starter that we can count on at right tackle, let's trade up and get Ike Mokonu. That makes sense, right? Like you don't want to settle with the backup plan and then try to make him work because then you're going to be like, damn, I wish we gave up that second round pick because that second round pick could end up being a bust anyway. So imagine your first round pick and your second round pick are both busts. Well, then you're just going to be sitting there kicking yourself, wishing that you traded up and use that second round pick to go ahead and get the more surefire offensive tackle prospect that you really want and really need. So if the Giants have a conviction, if Joe Shane has a conviction on a Quonu and they feel like they need to trade up and go get him, then they should. I mean, that's just how it works, right? Anytime you see a franchise quarterback in the draft, right? If you think that he's your franchise guy, you trade up to go get him if there's another team in front of you that might take him. It's kind of the same thing with an offensive tackle. Like offensive tackles are a premium. They're one of the most important positions in football. Your your quarterback that you just tr maybe traded up for to get won't have the same success as any other quarterbacks unless they have a good offensive line in front of them. So getting that offensive tackle, the franchise offensive tackles is nearly as important, maybe not, but it's close to the same level of importance as getting that quarterback. Because again, 
offensive line success and quarterback success, they are definitely correlated. It's important to have both of those positions locked down for the long haul. So it's definitely important for the Giants if they're sitting there and they want a Quonu or maybe they want Evan Neal, but Evan Neal's already off the board. And one of those teams calls them is like, hey, trade up two picks. We'll take just your third round pick or your second round pick. You just move up. You don't have to give up that other first round pick for sure. That might be worth doing so that they can get that offensive tackle. Those two bookends on both sides of the offensive line. Yeah, Andrew Thomas at left tackle, Quono at right tackle, and you are set for hopefully the next five to ten years at both of those offensive tackle positions. And then, I mean, you just look at the value that that could add to your team for the long run, right? Not even in the short run. Maybe you're trading up because you need a Quono in year one, but think about what he can do in year two, three, four, five, six. That long term, the draft is never about the now. It's never about the present. It's always about the future. These are the youngest players entering the league, trying to make a name for themselves. You're building around these players for the long run. And that's ultimately why Equonu might be worth trading up for two spots and giving up a second round pick. It might be worth it. I'm not sure if that would be the right compensation. I don't, of course, this is all speculation, but I could see a scenario where the Giants do that. And I actually do get behind it and support it because, listen, Charles Cross. Sounds like a great prospect, but Aquonu sounds like he's widely considered to be the better prospect. And at that point in the draft, the draft is always a crapshoot. You never know what you're going to get, but you always want to get guys that you think are going like they're more of a surefire pick, right? Because there aren't many in this draft. There, in any single draft class, draft class, there's probably like three players that are guaranteed to be great. If you think Aquonu is one of those is one of those players that's guaranteed to be a great player then it's worth it to move up and get him rather than settling on a crapshoot with another offensive tackle later in the draft. Right. And like, when you look at what the giants have done in recent years, um, they've really stunted Daniel Jones's growth because they failed to get that offensive line situated. Now's the time to do it, right? If you, if you, like you said, if you think that Ikema Kwonu is going to be that good, you go and get him. Um, and for the most part, he's neck and neck. A lot of people have him one, two, two, one with Evan Neal. So you really, can't go wrong with either. I think that Evan Neal is the better run blocker at this point. Um, but Ikem Okonu is coming out as a really good pass blocker. And he's he's taken such tremendous steps forward. And let me say, that's important. Remember, remember in yesterday's video, we were talking about the players that we were um, you know, thinking could be cut candidates. And I was mentioning the fullback position, how it's not as important. Well, think about that, right? Coming from the perspective of Brian Dable stepping in here and implementing his offensive scheme that runs the ball almost seven or runs the ball almost 30% of the time while passing the ball almost 70% of the time. So on the Giants draft board, in terms of who fits their scheme better, they might have Ikem Okwonu number one and Evan Neal number two based on the fact that Okwonu is better in pass protection and Evan Neal is better as run blocker. That might be really important for the Giants right now as they try and build this, this team to fit Brian Dable's scheme. They need better pass protectors because Brian Dable calls passing plays far more than he calls running plays, almost double the amount. It's I think it was like a 67% split for 67 in favor of passing, which is a really high mark. Most teams are, you know, in the 50s, the low 50s. It's really balanced. I think the Giants might have even been um, around like 52% on the passing. That's a major increase uh, for the Bills to be at 67% passing on most of the time. I saw a great article about that Brian Dable's offense and how frequently they decide to pass the football, how they don't put an emphasis on extra running backs in the backfield. They run a lot of 10 and 11 personnel. So when you take a look at, is this guy a better pass blocker or a better run blocker and compare those two prospects, there's a really good argument to be made that Brian Dable might value Okwonu a little bit more because he's a better pass protector. Guys, here's some big news just in time for the Super Bowl. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 56. It's officially live right here in New York, and mobile sports betting is active. Make sure to take advantage of that. With the DraftKings Sportsbook, it's an exciting time to be a sports fan, and DraftKings is making it even more exciting with this special offer. Listen to this. Not a new customer. You can experience Super Bowl 56 with same game parlays. Combine multiple bets from the same game for a bigger payout. The more legs you add, the more money you can win. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. Best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. No delays, nothing like that. And download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Sign up using Fireside, the code Fireside. Bet just $5 and win 280 in free bets if your team wins. That's 56 to 1 odds using code Fireside. Pretty simple. Sign up. Make sure to take advantage of that promo code before the Super Bowl. Obviously, Cincinnati Bengals. If they, if they drop down a little bit lower, I'm definitely going to be smashing the over on that because they somehow find a way to win despite Eli Apple and his mom trying to get all crazy up in here. But I'm excited, guys. Make sure to take advantage and enjoy the rest of the episode.
Yeah, and then, you know, talking about, you know, 11 personnel, Mike Kafka and the Chiefs, they pretty much run a lot of 11 personnel. They don't use two tight ends ever. It's always Travis Kelsey as their lone tight end. Um, and when you're thinking about that, you know, you have one running back, one tight end. And the thing about it is that if the Giants do end up keeping Saquon Barkley, it kind of forces them to run a little bit more, you know, because you have Devin Singletary, you have Zach Moss, maybe you have Clyde Edwards-Hilaire and you have Damian Williams. And then you have Saquon Barkley, and Saquon Barkley automatically is going to command more reps just because the offense and like the coordinators always feel like he has to have the ball in his hands. However, the Giants have done such a poor job getting him the ball as a receiver. Um, you know, he had some dropping issues last year. He didn't really he was he, he didn't seem very confident. But I think that with Kafka, with Dable, they're going to get him into positions where he can succeed in the open field. Coming off one year off the ACL tear, um, I think he's going to be a lot more healthy next season and a lot more confident in his knee having taken a full season's workload. Uh, but with that being said. I do agree with you. I think that, you know, having that pure pass blocker right out of the gates, and, and that's not to say E.K. McQuonu is not going to be a good run blocker. He's just not as proficient in run blocking as he is as a pass blocker right now. But I think for what the Giants need, and they need to protect Daniel Jones and whoever the quarterback is, they need the pass blocker as essential piece, um, replacing Nate Solder, the, the turnstile out of Trader Joe's. Um, essentially you need that that proficient pass blocker to come in here and hold the right tackle spot down. And I'm curious to see how they're going to build out the interior line, right? We need a center, Nick Gates. I, I love the guy, but I don't think uh, I can put confidence in him making a full return just yet. So we might, we need a center. We need, and we need two guards because Will Hernandez is leaving as well. So um, there's a couple of guys in the draft who I like. Zion Johnson's one of them um, out of Boston College. He was at the Senior Bowl. He looked pretty solid. Um, Kennard um, it, it also looked pretty good. So, there's some there's some players there, but there's a drop off, right? There's not that many great interior linemen, so we're also going to have to look to free agency. We're going to have to clear up some money. I, I know they need about forty million dollars. They can go out and get a guard for maybe eight to ten million. Um, so we'll see how they approach that. But Ike Makonu is a great first step if they trade up. And and just to give you an idea, uh, Anthony and, and you guys listening right now, the draft chart is interesting, right? So I'm looking at the draft value chart. So the Giants have the fifth overall pick, which is valued at seventeen hundred points. Um, the Houston's pick is 2,200 points. So that's a 500 point differential. The Giants' uh, second round pick is 540 points. So that would match up. They could give the second round pick um, to Houston to get that to get that uh, selection. Alternatively, they could look to the third round. The Giants have two third round picks, one at 67, which is worth 255 points. Um, and they have another one that's worth 185 points. So maybe they can use those two third round picks to move up because I think I'd rather move up I'd rather package the, the two third round picks than give up my second round pick, Anthony. How would how do you would you kind of allocate that value? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to say. Like, I'd probably agree with you just because a second round pick, you're probably more likely of finding a star. But the Giants might be looking at the third round picks and saying, well, we can get some really good solid contributors and fill out this roster with some good depth. Now it's a little bit different because you take a look at what the Giants have done in recent years with their third round picks, and it's like jack shit, right? But that was Dave Gettleman drafting. Take a look at what the Buffalo Bills have done in recent years with their third round picks, and it's probably a little bit better because Joe Shane has been involved with Brandon Bean and has been drafting in the third round. And they've been finding a lot of great middle round talent. So I guess it's going to come down to what Joe Shane values more. What does he prefer? Does he prefer to take a second round pick player or a third round pick player? And in that case, you're getting three or uh, two two players in the third round. So that's pretty important as well. But personally, me, I think I prefer to go with the second round pick. Keep that one because the second round pick, you just always like every year, especially with the Giants picking as high as they are. We see players that are supposed to go in the first round just fall into the second. And, you know, we don't see that as often in the third round where you see really good second round prospects fall into the third. That's not as frequent. I feel like more often, like Xavier McKinney is a prime example. He was a first round prospect, a top 20 pick on most mock drafts, fell into the second round. Giants got him absolute steal. So that's a scenario that I dream for. You know, even players like um, what's his name? The offensive tackle that went to the Bears. He's an absolute beast. Trevin Jenkins, I think it was. He's a beast. He was supposed to go in the first round, fell into the second round. Great selection there. Obviously, he got hurt, didn't play much this year, but still a great selection. The value that you're extracting in the second round is always going to be greater than what you're going to extract in the third round. Right. I completely agree. And if it was Dave Gettleman still here, I would say get rid of those third round picks because that guy is it's a graveyard in the mid rounds for Dave Gettleman's tenure. Um, but I do think Joe Shane's going to have a lot better success um, drafting guys in those mid rounds, getting some value from them. You know, he got he did a couple of really good players. I think Deion Dawkins and uh, Milano, their linebacker, uh, looked really good. So that's something to keep in mind. 
They also got Spencer Brown, who was a starter last year for them in the third round um, out of Northern Iowa, same, same school as Trevor Penning. So that's another guy that we're going to talk about eventually. And maybe, um, you know, we'll do a film breakdown on him as well, because he's one of those tackles that if the giants did say, you know what, Iquon was off the board, Neil's off the board. We don't really like Charles cross. We kind of, we kind of loop him into the same area as Trevor Penning. You just trade back and you probably get Penning in the 10 to 15 range. Um, and then maybe you get some more capital and have more swings at, of the bat, as uh, Joe Shane would say. But Kim Okwonu, definitely a great prospect to land. Um, if you get him, if you trade up and get him, you're feeling really good. Obviously, the Giants would be very confident he's going to be a great player. So that's kind of the decision. That's the factor, you, the variable you have to consider is maybe they don't they, they think there's a massive drop-off after Okwonu and Neal. But at the seventh overall pick, the Giants end up getting Kayvon Thibodeau. Now, that is a really interesting thing because Kayvon Thibodeau, is dropping down the, the draft board at a at a rapid rate. He was like first overall projection like a month ago. Now he's going to at seven for the Giants, and he fits our scheme to perfection. The fact that we just brought in Andre Patterson from the Vikings, that guy helped develop Daniel Hunter. He helped develop um, uh, Everson Griffin. You know these guys are so are so talented, so good. He would be able to do some really phenomenal things. Um, with that outside linebacker core. I don't know if, because he's a defensive line coach, so I don't know if he'll be coaching the outside linebackers or that'd be a Brian Cox thing because, you know, he's working with the linebackers, so maybe they would work together. Who knows how that would go? But um, ultimately, when I'm looking at this, Kayvon Thibodeau is a stud, right? He is a a, a solid player with unbelievable um, attributes, speed, strength. He has had some injury issues in the past. Um, he has maybe disappeared in a game or two, but, you know, what what prospect hasn't had a bad game? Um, I think Kayvon Thibodeau at seven would be an absolute steal. Now, the thing is, there are concerns about his character kind of rising, that maybe he doesn't have the work ethic or the motor. Um, or, you know, Joe Shane also mentioned that when it comes to injuries, are you capable of pushing through an injury and playing hurt? Can you do that type of thing? Kayvon Thibodeau may not be the guy that uh, they can they can entrust to do that. Um, at the same time, he's like, I don't want to play for the Rams because their tax rate is too high. So it's like, mm, when you're talking about things like that, like you don't get to pick who you get drafted to, right? You don't get to choose these things. And when you're saying, I don't want to be drafted by a team, even though he's a Rams fan since he was a kid, saying that kind of thing because it's a financial reason is a bad thing. It's a bad uh, a bad character flaw that some people might say um, or analysts or, or GMs might say, you know what, like I don't want to I don't want to deal with that because when he's worried about that, that means he's not focused on football, not focused on what he's got to do on the field. He's worried about making money. Um, and you know, of course these guys want to make money, but at the same time, if you're using, if you're already talking about that with a combine coming up and you're trying to improve your draft stock, he's already falling, saying something like that only hurts your stock even more. So these red flags are definitely presenting themselves and it is a little bit concerning. However, if it's all just hearsay and it's just ends up going, you know, by the wayside and Thib Thibodeau ends up being an absolute stud, the Giants get him at seventh overall and he is a superior talent. He is an athletic freak. He is a phenomenal uh, player what he could do with the right coaching would be great. And I think landing Ikem Okonu and Kayvon Thibodeau with the first two picks that we have would be an unbelievable haul on paper, right? On paper, those two names are tremendous. You have an outside linebacker who has all pro potential and you have a right tackle now who also has pro bowl potential, um, maybe even more. So like that, that's really what you're looking at. And I think that when you are able to bolster both sides of the ball on both trenches, the offensive line and D and pass rush are the two most important parts of both uh, on both sides. So it's like when you get two prospects who are capable of being elite, you walk away pretty happy. Anthony, when you're talking about cave on Thibodeau, are you a little bit concerned about the reports that are coming out? Or do you think that, you know, it's all just BS and we can expect him to be as good as advertised? You know, it, it's tough to say um, every year. Like I said, every prospect is really a, a crapshoot. You never know what you're going to get. There's usually only like two or three players in every draft class. That might even be, a generous number. Maybe there's only ever one in every draft class. That's like a sure thing, right? Um, I guess like Nick Bosa was like the most sure thing. Chase Young was a sure thing, right? But that you're thinking about like one player per year that you could say is definitely going to be a great player. And so when you look at Kayvon Thibodeau, at one point, people thought he was the sure thing. But now there's some question marks about where's his head at? What's his what's his mentality for football? What's his love and passion for the game? And of course, that's where the NFL Combine gets really important because those interviews, the interview process at the NFL Combine is huge. If he goes into those interviews and he just doesn't do well, he doesn't test well for the majority of the teams, the teams talk, you know, they, they speak to each other. If he bombs all of his interviews, all of the teams will find out like they don't keep that secret. They'll tell people about that. And so if he bombs one interview and then another, those two teams are going to know about it. It's it, it becomes really messy. We've seen that with a guy like Ja'Kai Polite, 
who I've actually met. Ja'Kai Polite is not in the NFL anymore because he bombed all those interviews and his heart was not in the game at the time where he was entering the NFL draft and he ended up plummeting. He had a top 15 draft stock and he fell all the way into the third round and was out of the NFL within the next two years. So that can happen. I'm not saying that's going to happen to Kayvon Thibodeau by any means. Kayvon Thibodeau is far more talented than Ja'Kai Polite was coming out of college. Kayvon Thibodeau is a tremendous talent, and I do think he's going to be a good and successful player in this league. But the NFL Combine is important because that's when the teams don't get to just evaluate what he put on film. They get to evaluate who he is, what he puts in those interview rooms. And that's really important because there's definitely teams that interview some of these players don't like what they have to say, and then just move them down the draft board or even take them off the draft board. That happens frequently. So those that interview process is going to be really important for Kayvon Thibodeau. Hopefully he's able to nail those interviews, secure his draft stock. I hope the best for every prospect entering the draft. I like Kayvon Thibodeau. And if the Giants were to land him at number seven overall, I'd be ecstatic because this is a a guy who was considered to be a top three overall pick at some point. So if the Giants are able to get him at seven, that's a great value grab. And I think that ultimately he does have those traits of a top three pick. Like he has that talent. There are question marks or there's some yellow flags. I don't want to call them red flags yet, but some yellow flags. They're starting to push him down the draft board, but ultimately he does have that talent. All he needs is a great coaching staff to keep him in line, keep him in check and develop that talent. And he can be one of the best edge rushers in the NFL one day. I truly believe that. So Kayvon Thibodeau at number seven, I would love that, especially if you're talking about getting the Quonu at number five or number three on this mock draft. And then Kayvon Thibodeau at number seven, that's just a, top tier draft hall. That's excellent. That's like a home run out of the park. That's exactly what the Giants need. You get your offensive tackle, you get your edge rusher. Those are the two biggest positional needs for the Giants entering this year's draft. We saw it time and time again throughout the 2021 season. Those were the positions that they needed to improve. So if they're able to do that, improve both of those positions in the first round of this year's draft, then they're going to be walking away with big smiles on their face and hopefully a really successful 2022 season. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the Kayvon Thibodeau situation reminds me a lot of the Micah Parsons situation last draft class, right? Micah Parsons, everyone's like, this this was wrong with him. That's wrong with him. Red flags. Now I think everyone's like, shit, we should have taken Michael Parsons. <laughs> so maybe, you what know, Kayvon Thibodeau, that's what I'm saying. So like, you know, Kayvon Thibodeau, you know, you're looking at him now, people saying this, saying that. He says this, you know, Michael Parsons made some crazy comments on his Instagram. And, you know, everyone's now, everyone's like, I, I would have loved to have him. You know, I don't care what he says. So you know, I, and and but for the record, what Micah Parson was was uh, you know what people are saying were about about him were a lot worse than what people are saying about Kayvon Thibodeau with the whole scandal at Penn State. It was a lot worse. So you know, Kayvon Thibodeau, I'm not really overwhelmed by his, his stuff. You know, it's it's fair to mention it, but like you said, Anthony, if we got him at seven, I'm happy. I don't I don't think that there's a you know there's there's anything that bad that you know couldn't be fixed with a good coach. So you know. Seven, seventh overall, Kayvon Thibodeau and Elena Kwonu. I think you're walking away with a haul in the first round, and you're already looking at both sides of the football are now it drastically improved. Aziz Ojolari and Kayvon Thibodeau duo outside linebacker, that's a foundational building block. You, know, you can build around those two guys. Um, Andrew Thomas and Ikwonu at left and right tackle, you have cost control at the four most expensive positions in football aside from quarterback. Right, both tackle spots and both of your edge rushers. You know, you have them on rookie deals. That's how you build a team. That is how you build a roster. You, you, and then you have a. You still have Daniel Jones on his rookie contract as well. Maybe they'll draft a guy in 2023. That's how you do it. Yeah, and I'll even say they can draft a guy in 2023, then have both of the edge rushers and both of the offensive tackles all on rookie deals, which is just phenomenal. Or the financial flexibility that you would gain from having those two really expensive positions, offensive tackle and edge rusher on those cheap rookie contracts, you could take that money that you're not spending there and you could allocate it towards the quarterback position and potentially make one of those big time trades for one of these veterans that's looking to move on from their current teams, you know, like a Rodgers or a Russell Wilson. I know those are really unlikely scenarios, but all I'm trying to say is having those those specific positions on rookie contracts gives you a lot of flexibility financially to go spend that money at really important positions and go get the best players in the NFL. Yep, that, that that's how a lot of teams do. And I think the Giants, if they manage to hit a home run like like Lance Sterling's draft did. class indicates, 
Right. Yeah. The Rams did that. And now they're in the Super Bowl. And uh, of course, there's always stuff going on with other players, too. Like with OBJ, you know, he he went through a, a tough situation, ended up leaving the Browns and signs with the Rams on like a really cheap contract. Now he's in the Super Bowl and he's a big contributor there. And they and I always forget that they have Robert Woods, too. And like he is injured. So it's like insane how competent their offense is without their arguably, um, you know, their best receiver. I think Cooper Cup's better. But, you know, that's a conversation you guys can have. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just awesome to see, uh, you know, what, what teams do when they have the flexibility and the money to actually make things happen. The giants were a terrible team and had no money and they were, they were over, overspending at positions that, uh, positionally don't have much value. So that's kind of the problem. Hopefully Joe Shane and Dable are able to fix that. I think they will be able to, I'm really excited to see what they, what they can accomplish and the strategy they deploy during the draft guys, but I hope you enjoyed this episode of fireside giants. Make sure to like, and subscribe as always would love to hear your opinions below on the, on the draft picks in this specific mock draft. Um, personally, I think it was a, it's a home run, um, trading up. Definitely. I don't want to give up too much capital. Depends what you're giving up in that scenario. I'd rather trade back. But if you can land a Quonu and Kayvon Thibodeau, I think you got to stay put and take those guys, you know, because that that revolutionizes your team immediately day one and their impact starters um, on day one. So that's a big, a big point. But hopefully you guys have a fantastic rest of your day and we'll catch you guys on the next one.